which at various times there have been conflicts. Uh, there have been episodes that are, that are about as far from peace as, as can be. Uh, the, the, the country among these, the best performing countries are, uh, are uh, Cameroon and Lesotho. Uh, Lesotho is, uh, well, it's, uh, it sits there, it's a tiny country, it sits there in the middle of South Africa, and uh, that's a country in which uh, uh, for most of these countries, if I had made the picture in real income per capita, the curse would have looked almost identical. For the United States, real income is about the same as real GDP per capita. For the sort of, they, they're actually doing better than this picture shows because income is it, one of the textbook examples of where the difference between GDP and income can be pretty high. And the reason is that many inhabitants of Lesotho, they work in South Africa, they cross the border, and then they bring home their salaries. So the income is higher than what's being produced within their borders. So Lesotho does reasonably well. But you see uh, several countries that are doing very poorly. There's uh, Liberia, the uh, dark blue, there's the, uh, there's, uh, Burundi, Congo, the two Congos. Uh, I have Chad in this picture. Chad is a country that uh, ran into trouble only this past week. And uh, who knows what this picture will look like in uh, five or ten years if they cannot, if they cannot solve those problems. So, so I'll use these uh, pictures as motivations and as suggestive that there is a connection between uh, peace and economic development. And, and, and now I'll talk uh, in more detail about this very wide topic. And uh, because it's such a wide topic, in uh, 45 minutes I cannot really uh, cover such a broad aspect of it. I'll choose to talk about issues that are fairly close to my research. I get nervous if I have to go too far beyond what I uh, what I have researched myself, and, and so that's that's part of the uh, choice of, of uh, the selection of, of topics. Um, a quick overview of the talk is I'll uh, I'll give a it will be somewhat essential to give you a sense of. Uh, what the framework for modern macro macroeconomics is. I'll uh, talk about something that I think it was touched upon in the introduction, and uh, I'll, uh, I'll, uh, I'll talk about this issue of rules versus discretion. It, and it, it's an issue from uh, one of the two papers uh, uh, cited by the Nobel Committee. And what I'll try to do is give you a sense of the fundamental reason for this issue, for the resulting potential policy inconsistency over time. I'll give you a few acute examples, um, and then I'll give you the lessons I promised from, uh, uh, from Argentina and Ireland, and finally I'll make some general comments, some general remarks about the factors that either foster or hamper economic development. The, this framework, I suppose that's, that was one of the things cited by the Nobel uh, Committee, the Prescott and I coming up with it, this way of model, modeling map, the macroeconomy. It's in big contrast to the types of models that used to exist in the, um, in the 60s and the 70s. Uh, the, what Prescott and I did was we put people into the models. We uh, made an explicit um, description of the decision problems based, facing people. And, uh, and, and these decision problems are very dynamic. They are forward looking. Many of the most important decisions uh, in facing people, they are forward looking. Uh, the contrast with the previous framework was uh, 
course, uh, all macroeconomic models try to summarize what people do in the aggregate, but the previous framework did it in the form of many equations. For example, a consumption equation, an investment demand equation. Uh, consumption equation, I'm simplifying a little bit, but it might be something that said, if your uh, income goes up by uh, $1,000, your um, consumption goes up by $900. Well, uh, if you think about the economics of such a problem, it's clear that you cannot make such a blanket statement. It's got to make a big difference if that income, uh, the increase in income as, as being proposed in the so-called rescue package for, for the United States now associated with, with the uh, decline in activity associated with the so-called subprime mortgage crisis. Uh, that rescue package is, uh, is emphasized, is supposed to be temporary. Uh, in other words, a, a temporary reduction in taxes that will result in additional income. Um, I would predict that the increase in uh, consumption spending resulting from that will be no more than about 10%. If it had been a permanent increase, then most likely about 100% of it would be spent. And so that's, uh, with a temporary increase, most of it will be saved that's an example of the importance of the forward-lookingness of, uh, of, uh, of modern macroeconomics. So people are characterized by their preferences over goods, uh, uh, goods and services, let's say, and uh, lead you into the indefinite future. They uh, they are constrained in their behavior by by their by their budget constraints. From the point of view of the economy as a whole, it's constrained by the resources. Another important uh, resource taken into account in these models is, uh, is time. Very important uh, resource, as I'm sure you all, uh, uh, all understand. Uh, you also need a description of the business sector. Because the business sector, in some sense, provides a description of the capacity of the economy at every point in time to produce stuff, to produce the uh, consumption goods, to produce the so-called investment goods that will uh, uh, result in uh, future capacity to be augmented. Uh, and we often do that in the form of what we call the aggregate production function. It's, it describes the nation's technology for converting the two major inputs, capital in the form of um, factories, machines, office buildings, and so on, on the one hand, and labor input, the hours of work by all the workers in the economy into goods and services, into uh, consumption goods, into investment goods, and so on. Uh, now, the economy, typical economies have become better at doing this over time. And uh, this ability to do so more efficiently over time, to uh, think of or to invent better production processes, maybe to, to uh, produce more efficient machines to produce better goods, that ability we can call technological change. And that's a, such an important factor, it's such an important factor for the development of economies. As you can see, I put that in boldface letters. And uh, I do think a little more broadly about technological change than uh, what the words might say. It's not just research and development, innovation and so on, especially at the business side of frequency. Um, many things that happen in the economy could be as if there was a shock or a, a change in the technology, change in the ability to convert capital labor into uh, goods and services. Uh, the old shock, it turns out, was as behaved or resulted in, in uh, had the effect on the ability to produce as if it had been a negative shock to the technology level. There could be changes in the nature of contracting between 
businesses and, and workers. There could be a change in the or in the provision of infrastructure. Changes in regulations could play a role. I I would always, especially in Latin America, use the example of banking panics. Banking panics have uh, occurred from time to time. They occurred in the United States in the Great Depression in the early 30s. They have occurred in Argentina and other Latin American countries. And when they occur, usually they have a negative effect on the banking system, on the financial, um, the ability to uh, to financially intermediate, as we as we say in. in uh, in the economic language, intermediate between the savers, often um, millions of people saving small amounts, uh, and the investors who put these some sums of small amounts into big factories and machines and so on. Very important function, and if uh, if uh, their if their uh, uh, behavior is affected, for example, through a banking panic or now the subprime mortgage crisis, uh, it will be as if we throw sand into uh, a, a, an otherwise well-functioning machine and, uh, and it will be as if there's a technological negative shock. Uh, these models I use primarily to uh, ask quantitative questions. Uh, I think of them as a measure, measuring device and I think they have answered many, many interesting questions over time. Uh, computational ability, power has made it possible to, to ask a wider set of questions, questions that uh, requires that you introduce a lot of detail about household behavior over the business cycle. You know, even these days, uh, family behavior is, uh, is all the rage in the, in the research. It turns out there are many questions one can ask that, have, that whose answers hinge on uh, interactions or, or what generally is called family behavior. Now, of course, central to this talk is going to be the role of the government. And the government can be introduced as a third player. In addition to the household sector in the aggregate and the business sector, there's a government. And the government, of course, serves a very important function. There are services that would not have been provided if the government government hadn't taken them over. Uh, national security or security within cities or uh, uh, security anywhere is, is a good is a good example uh, of such a function. But there are many other functions served by the government. The government provides services to people and. Uh, to finance these services, they have to uh, get revenue from somewhere, uh, much of it in the form of uh, various types of taxes. The government is under uh, a budget constraint. If the, um, if the taxes fall short of the uh, services paid for, governments can typically borrow in return for uh, uh, promising to pay back later. Now, what Prescott and I did in that paper was we, we thought of a simplified 